Let's now look at another probability experiment. In this case, we're going to roll two dice and record the value on each die. Let's create a tree diagram first to start so we can see exactly what is in our sample space. So again, we usually start with a starting block. This tree diagram is going to be a little big, so we'll eventually see in a coming slide that you can do this in some simpler ways. But for now, we want to be able to visualize this. So you have roll one for the first roll, and then you have roll two. Well, what can happen on roll one? Well, you could get a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six. Then for roll two, remember you want to consider what happened on roll one. So for example, if you got a one on roll one, roll two, you could get a one, two, three, four, five, or six. On roll one, if you got a two, then on roll two, you could get also a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six, because the first roll does not affect what happens on the second roll. The two rolls are independent of one another. So out of each of these, you're going to have six branches. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And finally, one, two, three, four, five, six coming out of this six. Now that we have a representation of the entire sample space, we can see what can happen when you roll two dice. Let's now look at a few questions about this experiment. Let's now answer these probability questions about that experiment of rolling two dice and recording the value on each die. In the previous slide, we created the tree diagram, but because there's not enough space here, I created an alternate version of the tree diagram. This represents the entire sample space. It's the same idea as the tree diagram, since, for example, you could get a one on the first one and a one on the second one, a one on the first, a two on the second, a one on the first roll, a three on the second or second roll, a one on the first roll, four, so on and so forth. So these in here in this box are all the possible outcomes. So let's go through and answer these four questions. What's the sample size? Well, there, this is a rectangle that is six by six. Six times six gives you 36. So there's 36 total possible outcomes in this experiment. So our probabilities are going to be out of 36. Now, what's the likelihood of rolling doubles? Well, let's go through and fall and find all the desired outcomes, in this case, doubles. The 1-1 one, one is a double, the 2-2, two, two, the 3-3, three, three, the 4-4, four, four, the 5-5, five, five, and the 6-6, six, six, leaving us with a total of six doubles. So six out of 36, meaning there's a six in 36 chance that when you roll two dice, you'll get doubles. The next one, what's the chance of rolling a sum of seven or 11? So we want seven or 11. Let's go through and find all the sevens. These add to seven, these add to seven, this one, this one, this one, and this one as well. And then also five and six and six and five add together to give you 11. This gives us a total of eight possibilities. Eight possibilities out of, again, the total of 36 possibilities. So there's an eight and 36 chance that you can roll a sum of seven or 11. This would be something you would want to know if you were going to say play craps. Also, notice here that I've not reduced these fractions. That's okay, you do not need to in this particular section because I really want you to know exactly where the six came from and where the 36 came from, or where the eight came from and where the 36 came from. If I reduce these things, then you may not know exactly what those num the numerator and denominator are representing. Then finally, what's the probability of rolling a sum of at least 10? So at least 10 is 10 or more. So where are the tens? Well, you could get four and six, five and five, four and six, or the 11s, you could get six and five, and five and six, or 12, you could get six and six, for a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, for six possibilities out of 36. So by having this sample space here right in front of us, we can fairly easily get these probabilities. But I wanna go back to this question of here, what's the sample size? How can we get that 36 without having to draw this entire thing here? That's what we'll do in the next slide. How can you get the sample size without having to draw the entire tree diagram? 
As we've seen, the sample size is very important. It's been the denominator in all of our probabilities. Well, we're going to introduce something called the fun fundamental counting principle here. If you notice in the tree diagrams, for example, with rolling two dice, in flip one, there were six branches. And then for flip two, there were six branches coming out of each of those original six branches. Six branches coming out of six branches gives us a total of six times six equals 36 paths through that tree diagram. So it's really dependent on multiplication. Hence, we now have something called the fundamental counting principle. In general, if you can do one thing in M ways, and something else can be done in N ways, then if you want to do them in sequence, do both of them in order, then they can be done in M times N ways. And this generalizes to any number of, of steps. It could be two steps, five steps, 20 steps, it doesn't matter. So let's look at a basic example. Let's say you go to a restaurant and they've got three drinks you can choose from. They've got five entrees and two desserts. Let's say a meal consists of one drink, one entree, and one dessert. You might want to know how many possible meals are there. Well, we can get the total number of meals without having to draw out the tree diagram. Because there's three ways to choose for drinks, there's five ways to choose your entree, and there's two different ways or, or possibilities you could choose for your dessert. So the total number of meals, if you need one of each, is 3 times 5 times 2, which equals 30. So there are 30 possible meals when you have to choose one of three drinks, one of five entrees, and one of two desserts. Let's look at another example. With this particular example, we're going to use the fundamental counting principle. You absolutely would not want to draw the tree diagram because it would be very, very large. You'll see shortly. So suppose motorcycle license plates in Wyoming consist of five characters and have the following scheme. The first, second, and last characters must be letters. The third and fourth characters must be digits. And the digits can repeat, but the letters cannot. How many license plates are possible? If you tried to do this with a tree diagram, it would be massive. So instead, I want to use the fundamental counting principle. And I like to start by just listing five dashes, because we're talking about a five-character license plate. And it says the first, second, and last characters must be letters. Let's make sure everybody's clear. We're talking about in the English alphabet, there are 26 letters. And then you have to have a digit in the third and fourth spot. There are 10 digits in our number system. So the first, second, and last characters must be letters. And it also says the letters cannot repeat. So that means for the first spot, you've got 26 choices. Let's say that's an E. That then means you cannot use an E in that next spot. So there's only 25 possibilities left. Let's say that's a Q. So you've used an E and you've used a Q. Then in the last spot, there's got to be another letter, but it can't be an E or a Q. So you've got to take two off of the 26 leaving us with just 24 possible choices left. Then the third and the fourth characters must be digits. It says the digits can repeat. So you can put any of the 10 digits here. And since you can repeat it, you can put any of the 10 digits here. So you're doing essentially five things. You could do first thing in 26 ways, second thing in 25 ways, third thing in 10 ways, fourth thing in 10 ways, fifth thing in 24 ways. So the total number of ways to do all of them in sequence is 26 times 25 times 10 times 10 times 24, which gives you 1,560,000. So there's 1,560,000 possible license plates under this particular scheme. So could the state of Wyoming register 2 million motorcycles? And remember that each registration has to be unique. Like we can't share social security numbers. We don't share uh, license plate numbers. Each of them has to be unique. So if they want to be able to register 2 million different motorcycles, do they have enough? No, 2 million is greater than the 1.56 million that they can account for in this scheme. So if they know they're gonna to need to register 2 million motorcycles, they need to choose a different scheme. Maybe add on a sixth digit or sixth uh, character. Uh, maybe change it so that these can repeat. There's a variety of things you could do to make this number larger.
But so the answer here is no. But now let's get back to the probability again. What's the likelihood Steve will get the license plate NJ33P if he's assigned one at random? Let's say for some reason NJ33P has meaning to Steve. Maybe he's from New Jersey originally, played baseball, his number was 33, who knows. But if he wanted that specific license plate, that is one license plate out of the 1,560,000 total possible license plates. So if he was going to choose one at random, he's got a 1 in 1,560,000 1, chance of getting that specific license plate. So if Steve really wanted that, there's a very tiny chance that he would get that at random. This is why we have vanity plates. You can actually pay additional money to get specific license plates that you'd like to have if they're not already used by someone else.